Ice skating is a discipline in figure skating that historically drew influence from ballroom dancing. I mean, as soon as you hear it, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But never has it occurred to me that at some point there was a person at one of those events of the 1800s from Pride and Prejudice who was like, you know what would really spice this party up? Ice skates. And someone nearby was like, oh, Reginald, don't be silly. It does make sense though when you realize that ice dancing is not the same as figure skating. Ice dance includes lifting, spinning, and twizzles, while figure skating includes moves that are more acrobatic. Jumps, partners being tossed into the air, death spirals. Basically all the stuff you think of when you hear the phrase figure skating. Sorry, ice dancers. Ice dance has its roots in combined skating, which was a social event in which couples or friends would skate to marches, waltzes, or other styles. In the late 19th century, there were attempts by the Viennese, meaning people from Vienna, Austria, as well as the British, meaning people from Britain. There are historians, however, who think it traces back to hand-in-hand -hand skating, which was a short-lived but popular style of skating in England in the 1890s. My personal opinion is that the English like stealing credit for things. Actually, just stealing in general. If you're thinking hand-in-hand -hand skating, sounds like a name they made up to make a boring activity sound more interesting. You're absolutely correct. Unlike the modern, developed version of ice dance we have today, hand-in-hand -hand skaters usually had both feet on the ground. But let's not judge. It was the 1890s. Hand-in-hand -hand skating was probably the most interesting thing people had ever seen. They certainly didn't know what a like button was, which you should leave on this video if you want to contribute to my success. The father of figure skating is a man named Jackson Haynes. And I know I just said figure skating isn't the same thing, but he still had an influence on ice dance. And this isn't a part of the article, but I'm 90% sure that's just Edgar Allan Poe in disguise. Haynes was an American who introduced his style of ice skating to Europe. At the time, figure skating was performed in the European style, but Haynes had a background in ballet, which he incorporated techniques from to create more graceful programs. So give me just one second while I write that down in my book. America does contribute to civilization. People just don't like to acknowledge it for some reason. Let's see, should I put it between jazz and modern cinema or the smartphone and flight? Capitalizing on the popularity of the waltz in Vienna, Jackson Haynes introduced a variation of the American waltz to figure skating, thus creating one of the earliest iterations of ice dance. The waltz, by the way, is that super simple dance where each step lasts one beat of the music, which repeats as the partners move in a square or circular pattern. By the end of the 19th century, the three-step waltz, known as the English waltz in Europe, had become the standard at waltzing competitions. It was first skated in Paris in 1894 and is said to be responsible for popularizing ice dance in Europe. The reason being the three-step waltz was relatively easy and could be performed by less skilled skaters, while more experienced skaters could add more variations to make it more difficult. This, as well as the Killian and the 14 step, were all skating steps that survived the transition from the 19th to the 20th century. Whoa, 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 the Killian 14 steps? I didn't come to YouTube to think. Yes, I know. I'm here to tell you that you actually do know what the 14 step is. You just never realize that's what it's called. As explained by what I assume is a gentle-natured old man in this video. This is a basic level dance with 14 steps and is skated to brisk, lively march music. And the Killian is just this thing. They're both just fancy names for two of the most common parts of a skating routine. So you can see that by the early 1900s, ice dance had already moved away from the more static style of the waltz and into more continuous movement with the speed and flow we're familiar with in ice skating today. At this point, historians say that Vienna, Austria was the dancing capital of the world, both on and off skates. But that's not to say it wasn't popular elsewhere. Ice dance had become popular around the world, though it was primarily recreational and not competitive. It wasn't until the 1920s that clubs in Britain and the US started conducting informal dance contests in the 10-step, 14-step, and Killian, which were the only three dances used in competition until the 1930s. The reason this changed in the 30s is because three British teams, each of which were a couple, introduced so many dances that by 2006, 25% of the International Skating Union's competitions, which is the governing body for everything ice skating across the entire world, were created by one of those three couples in the 1930s. The 1930s saw a swell of ice dance popularity and were described as being the backbone of skating clubs throughout the world. It wasn't until the 1950s that the ISU, 
Again, the International Skating Union began developing rules, standards, and even international tests for ice dance. The first international ice skating competition occurred as a special event in the 1950 World Figure Skating Championships in London. And it was won by an American couple, to the embarrassment of the British, who considered themselves the best in the world. I swear I'm not just trying to highlight American accomplishments in this video. Contrary to the way it may appear, I'm actually not that proud of an American, but we are good at sports, and I do think it's objectively wrong when people say we don't have culture. And to that point, the next five world championships were all won by the same British couple, and the next five after that were won by other British couples. It wasn't until 1962 that non-British ice dancers won the competition. The Czechoslovakian brother-sister duo Ivo Romanova and Pavel Roman ended the British championship streak. You might have noticed I skipped right over 1961. And brace yourself to be sad. The 1961 event was cancelled because of the crash of Sabina Flight 548. It was a plane traveling from America to Europe, and it crashed in Belgium. It included all 18 members of the American figure skating team, none of which survived. Events like this are why, I assume, sports teams, politicians, and other important figures are now often split up to fly separately. Prague was retained as the location of the World Championships for the following year, which was the capital of Czechoslovakia, now two separate countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, which is where Eva and Pavel took the title. In 1976, ice dance became an Olympic sport. Ludmila Pakhomova and Alexander Gorshkov from the Soviet Union were the first gold medalists of the Olympics. And the Soviet Union in general dominated the world of ice dance, taking the gold medal literally every year of the 70s. The 70s were also one of the major shifts away from ice dance's roots in ballroom dancing and into a more theatrical style. Due to this, the ISU pushed back throughout the 80s and the 90s by tightening the rules and definition of ice dance to emphasize its connection with ballroom dancing. The point of these restrictions was to emphasize skating skill over artistic interpretation. As you can imagine, this caused some degree of controversy within the community. If you know anything about ice skating, you'll know that it hasn't always been free from corruption. And it makes sense. If you restrict ice dancing, an inherently artistic sport, into a skill-based competition, all the artistic elements that make it fun to watch go away. But if you allow for more artistic expression, the sport becomes more fun to watch, but also opens up the risk that a judge just preferred the style of a certain team. This exact problem could be seen in the 2002 Olympics. While this was for figure skating and not for ice dance, and also didn't explicitly surround artistic expression, two teams ended up taking home the gold medal because of corruption concerns among the judges. It's an interesting story to look into. You can even hear the disbelief in both the announcers and the audience when the scores were laid down. Comes down to the second mark. Oh! The placements. How did that happen? The placements. Look at this. How did that happen? Oh. They won that program. Twos and four number ones. They won that program. I, I, there's not a doubt with anyone in the place except for maybe a few judges. That will be debated forever. Second place. Second place. Ever. Various countries have been competitive since the year 2000. Canada produced two of the most dominant ice dancers in history in Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. The U.S. won several international competitions, and as recently as 2022, France won gold in both the World Championships and the Olympics. You might have noticed I didn't get too bogged down in the specifics of ice dance's structure and required movesets. That's because a lot of it has shifted over the years. For a long time, there was a compulsory dance, an original dance, and a free dance. That changed in 2010 to just a rhythm dance and a free dance. You can imagine it would be a little tedious to walk through every specification that's changed at one point or another, but not for all of you. Some of you are going to want to read the article, which I encourage you to do if you want to learn more. I just don't know how to say something like curve dance lift and succinctly describe exactly what makes it a curve dance lift. Go ahead. Try to imagine what a curve dance lift looks like. I'll give you a moment. It's this. This is a curved dance lift. Well, Sean, you can describe that, can't you? Sure. A movement in which one of the partners is elevated with active and or passive assistance of the other partner to any permitted height, sustained there, and set down on the ice. There you go. So this is where I pass it to you. Get out there and learn for yourself. Or if you don't want to read, go watch Meddling, the documentary on the 2002 figure skating scandal that I mentioned earlier. I gotta edit this video now, so I'll see you guys next week.